Hi, Red Hat developers. This is Jason with the Red Hat Developers Program. This morning, we're introducing John Osborne from Red Hat. He's going to be talking about Kubernetes, past, present, and future at Summit 2017. All right, everyone, thank you. Uh, this lightning talk, I'm going to focus around Kubernetes, past, present, and future. So what really, what really what that means is I'm going to focus on how we got here. So uh, Google really shook up a lot of people when they said a couple years ago that they've never run virtual machines. They've been running only containers at scale for the past 10 years. And when they spun out Kubernetes, Kubernetes is really their third um, orchestration management tool. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the past and present on the lessons learned by Kubernetes into, or by Google into creating Kubernetes, what they learned out of their first two systems, Borg and Omega, um, the types of things they did well, didn't do well, how those rolled into Kubernetes and how we got here today, what the community is doing on top of uh, Kubernetes now and kind of where it's going integrating with things like the Open Container Initiative and the Open Service Broker API, things like that. So first, we're talking about containers, and many people don't realize, but containers really aren't new. Uh, the first container uh, technology really came around, you know, you could argue even 20 years ago with, with change root, and most people are all familiar with that. Even today, a lot of people use change root to break into their Linux or Windows machine if they need to, uh, like change a password, for instance. But each time, the technology iterated more and more. So BSD introduced a lot of concepts around isolation of the namespaces and PIDs. Um, Solaris had Solaris zones. You know, fast forward, C groups is actually a technology most people don't realize came out of came out of Google. So, one thing that Google did was that they realized uh, they were trying to eke out all the performance they could because when you have a minor uh, a minor performance problem at scale, that becomes a very large problem. So, C groups was designed to isolate resource limits. So, at Google, for instance, when you go spin up your Gmail, that actually is spinning up a container on the back end. But they also have a ton of batch processing jobs, so they want to be able to run batch processing and your Gmail container in the same, uh, on the same physical server without, without having any latency or interference or basically a denial of service attack you know, on that container. So Google came out with cgroups, they open sourced it, that came into the Linux kernel. Red Hat, of course, has worked on almost all the Linux namespaces at this point, um, and I think there's eight of them total. Uh, IBM contributed with LXC, and then the initial release of Docker, most people don't realize, it actually just took LXC and built uh, a format, an API, and a runtime on top of that. Um, but it was really actually just connecting into the LXC, uh, which was the first open source uh, kernel, the Linux, the Linux uh, container, the first open source Linux container back in 2008. You know, since then, Docker is re-architected into several other components, and LXC is actually not a part of it. Um, but that's, their initial release was based around that. So in parallel to that, Google, as I mentioned, has been running just containers in their, their data center. They never run a virtual machine. So and before Docker, they were using just uh, containers called, if you're familiar with, uh, uh, there's a website called Let Me Containerize That For You, um, or Let Me Google That For You, which is if someone asks you a, a silly question, you can send them this link and it'll just, you click on it and then it'll Google the thing that they should have just looked up on Google in the first place, right? So they actually had their own container format called Let Me Containerize That For You, which is based around that joke. But, they have been running containers at scale, and they, they learned a lot of important lessons learned in that time. So and I'll just go through a few of these. There's several white papers out there, and if you come to, to KubeCon, uh, last year was in Seattle, and it was a ton of fun. You get to meet a lot of the core developers uh, that build it. Uh, this year will be in Austin in December, so I highly recommend if you're interested, you know, register for it. It's a, it's a great time. It's an OpenShift Commons event where we normally have uh, a lot of the key developers to Kubernetes come the day before KubeCon. Um, so you can, you can talk to the engineers about some of these things, but they're very critical into, into the lessons learned because Google, their first crack at orchestration was called Borg, the second one was called Omega, and the third one, Kubernetes, to work with uh, Docker and now Open Container Initiative containers. Um, there's lots of key things that they learned what not to do, essentially. So the first thing was they really wanted consistent APIs and object structures, and this was really important because their first tool called Borg didn't really have a very well consistency. A lot of things grew ad hoc, and by the end of Borg's lifespan, it was being, being becoming very hard to manage. They also wanted to decouple a separation of concerns, and make, but make sure everything uh, shares the same building blocks. So, uh, and this is really critical because they really wanted to avoid, avoid building a large centralized uh, management tool that, be, that be, can become brittle. So the way that they 
the way that they built it was to essentially create a lot of different microservices that work in control loops. And why this is really important is because if the whole system crashes, so if OpenShift just crashes or Kubernetes crashes, or if the masters just go down, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to try to figure out or pick up where it, le where it got left off. It's literally just going to start back up and it's going to start running con control groups and checks against all these different microservices. And that separation of concerns was also really important too because by not getting too tied into opinions, you're able to swap in and out different ideas. So for instance, within Kubernetes, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to run containers. There's replication controllers, there's jobs, there's daemon sets. By having a similar look and feel, you can, you can learn how these things all work very seamlessly, and you don't necessarily have to worry about uh, getting too tied in or you know, things uh, breaking as you go forward or make, as you want to make changes. Other lessons learned that are really important. So labeling the first iteration at Borg, they actually just use numbers to label to identify their containers. And you know, that's not very scalable, right? Because it, as you develop more and more containers, you, know, you need a way to group those together. So the idea of using labels is actually really important. And believe it or not, the first iteration at Borg, all the containers did not have their own IP addresses. They actually just shared the IP of the host. And they just kept changing the port numbers on their apps. So if I had a database connecting, or if I had an application connecting to a database, I had to find out which container that database was running in, and then they needed another, another tool to tell the app what port number that database was running on. And then if the database died and got moved somewhere else, well then they had some other uh, orchestration tool or some other management tool that find out what the new port was for the database and sent that port to, the, to update the application. So it was, it was really um, a lesson of what not to do, and when they, when they developed Kubernetes, you know, having one IP per pod is really uh, one of the most crucial design decisions that they, that they made. Finally, this is one's very important too. So everybody comes in through the front door in Kubernetes. That means nobody's accessing etcd directly. Everyone's coming in through the Kubernetes API if you're using OpenShift. So OpenShift API accessing um, etcd. Nobody is able to access the data store directly because ultimately that's just going to lead to bad things. So by pretty, much any, by pretty much any objective measure right now, Kubernetes is the de facto standard to run containers. Um, I did some analysis using Google BigQuery. It's the most popular project on GitHub by, by just about every single measure at this point in terms of contributors and comments and stars and all those things. So it's an extremely popular project. If you use just containers by itself, there's lots of things that you don't get, right? You don't get auto scaling. You don't get health and status and recovery. You don't get the ability to mount configurations and secrets to your containers at runtime so that uh, your, your actual images themselves uh, don't contain data that might only apply to one specific environment. And I mentioned, by pretty much any objective measure, Kubernetes is, the, is by far the most popular orchestration technology out there. Now, this is a two or three months old now, but since then, it's even gotten higher, right? So actually, you can see the job postings is actually from um, October 2016. Every time I go to check the Kubernetes repo in GitHub, there's more contributors, there's more uh, coders, and so forth. This was actually a study where they took the number of lines. This is pretty straightforward math, but they just took the number of lines in Kubernetes, the average developer salary, and multiplied the math, and they came out with, if you actually want to create a uh, Kubernetes from scratch, you need $120 million to, uh, to do so. Um, and one thing that most people don't realize is Kubernetes is actually managed by the Cloud Native uh, Compute Foundation, which is um, under the Linux Foundation. And there's all sorts of companies that, that are now contributing projects to there. It's grown from just Kubernetes to all sorts of other projects as well. So um, gRPC, uh, Influx Database, um, Prometheus is under the Cloud Native Com Compute Foundation, ContainerD, which is the, uh, was contributed by Docker as well as RunC to run containers. So these are all projects that um, are becoming managed by the Cloud Data Compute Foundation. And uh, these are all different companies that, that contribute as well. So it was really interesting. Last year at KubeCon, I got to meet a lot of people from Disney and Samsung that are actually using this running that scale. For Red Hat, I work in the public sector. So I've actually worked with about 25 federal agencies that have adopted Kubernetes. Um, and OpenShift in some capacity. So, um, you know, this is a technology that, even though it's only about three years old now, it's actually because of the development and velocity of the community, 
It's actually been proven out there in industry. So where are we going? So there's a few things. So one, the open container initiative. Everyone says, oh, Docker containers, but there's actually a standardized format now. So when if you use Docker, you go build a container with Docker build, it's actually creating an OCI compliant container. The open container initiative was to avoid vendor lock-in, and it has buy-in from pretty much, well, actually 100% of the, of the vendors that are out there. So Red Hat's the number one contributor right now, Docker's the second biggest contributor, um, IBM contributes, VMware, and so forth. It really specifies or standardizes two things. One is the runtime, so that's how you interact with the container, and two, the format. So if I ship around a container between different machines, I know I have a standardized format that I can use. So if I use Docker Build or some other tool to create a container, it doesn't matter because I'm creating a standard OCI compliant container. And where Kubernetes is going with, with Cryo, CRI-O there, it's called Cryo, is a way to run any OCI compliant container within Kubernetes. So in the first iteration of Kubernetes, they actually had custom code to run Docker containers. And then when they went to adopt Rocket, they had to have more custom code to hook in the Kubernetes lifecycle stuff, or uh, lifecycle hooks into Rocket. You know, that doesn't really scale because as you want to move things like Intel Clear containers or other different containers, you know, you don't want to have custom code that you're maintaining for every different container format. So with the Open Container Initiative in Cryo, it's a way to run any OCI compliant container without custom code. So that's what we're working on right now. We're just about there. Um, and then you'll be able to plug in any OCI compliant container um, and Kubernetes won't have to carry around custom code for, for specific to Docker and Rocket. With Windows servers, that's another thing that's, that we've been working on as well. We, we do have some alpha functionality right now where we're actually running uh, Kubernetes on Windows. Um, so hopefully that'll be more mature as the year goes on. And then the open source, uh, open service broker API, which is actually something, an idea that came out of the Cloud Foundry um, space and something that we're contributing as well, where it's basically be an open standard to uh, expose your containers inside a service catalog. And if you actually look on the uh, Red Hat, or no, the OpenShift uh, GitHub, account, you can see uh, some of the work we're doing there as well. So this is my last slide. I think, you know, it, I've, been, I've been working at Red Hat for four years. So I think one of the things we always tell our customers is that, you know, no vendor lock-in is critical. So when you're talking about containers or Kubernetes, you know, you can run containers anywhere you want. And OCI, the, the Open Container Initiative, is very important to everything we do um, for no vendor lock-in. So again, that, that's standardizing the runtime and the format and Kubernetes can run any OCI compliant container, which is almost all of them um, at this point. The ones that aren't OCI compliant yet are working to get, to get there. Um, so we think that this has a lot of benefits to, to all our customers. So that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you, my name is John Osborne, and I hope you enjoyed this talk and the rest of Red Hat Summit.